yeah, on the screen. Um, Naomi would like me to announce that due to uh, the snow and the inclement weather, there will be no choir practice tonight. Um, mission team continues to collect uh, January's items, um, peanut butter and jelly. Those go in the cart there by the door. There is a ministry team leader meeting um, Wednesday, January 6th, 26th at 7 p.m. Please, pl if you are a ministry leader, please bring all your scheduled events and meetings so we can coordinate our calendars. This week, um, shepherds are meeting just after church. Monday, Rebecca Circle meeting is canceled, 7 p.m. youth group, weather permitting. Um, and Wednesday at 7 p.m. Visionary Council meeting. Next week, just to get on your, your list, um, Wednesday the 26th is, once again, the ministry team leader meeting. I'll get my act together eventually when I figure out how all this works, I promise. All right. Will you, awesome, will you join me in our call to worship this morning? This is the day the Lord has made. This is the day we see God's presence face to face. This is the day our relationship with God changes. This is the day we have been waiting for. When this vision becomes reality in the body of Christ. Will you pray with me? We remember your word, Holy One. We remember what you have said and done. We remember your promise. We come today with all, all our experiences and thoughts the trials and joys of the week and of the past years, to lift them into the light of your life, that you may reveal new truth we could not see before, and draw us into deeper faithfulness. As we pray the prayer your Son taught us, saying, Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And deliver us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, um, I really, really promise I'm going to get my act together. And now will you join me in our opening hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Sadness, 
may be seated. When we gather in Christian community, it is good and right to share our hearts with one another. We do that through prayer. We call that our way of connecting, our way of one of the ways we express our connectedness as the body of Christ. And so we, consin- we, can- we consider this time to be a very sacred time, a time when we lift up all of those concerns and celebrate those joys that are laying on our hearts. We want to continue um, to pray for Denny Patchen, for Tammy Landacre and her family on the passing of Jake this week, for Harry Steele, Vicki Gargas and her hip replacement surgery, Joe Swipus fell and was taken to the hospital, and Diane, also for Diane Brown's family. Those are the prayer concerns I have. If there are others, please feel free to share them with me after church. I'm going to invite you into a time of prayer, a time of meditation. I Perhaps it's silly or woo-woo, but I really believe that when we invite the Holy Spirit into our midst, our bodies soften and our minds and hearts soften. So I invite you to let your shoulders relax, to quit clenching that jaw, you know you did it all night long, to breathe deeply, to relax a bit, to close your eyes, And let's invite the Holy Spirit with a few minutes of silence, and then I will close us with prayer. Will you go to God with me? What do you see when you come among us today, O God? We come seeking an experience of your presence, but we confess that we rarely look at our worship through your eyes. Show us the truth. Reveal to us your vision. For we confess there is more of a gap than we would like to admit. Forgive us when we have reduced our relationship with you to a transaction when we turn up and say the words and make our offering and expect you to bless us in return, to come when we call and turn away when we don't want you to look. Forgive us when we have created barriers to seeking you in our community, either saying or implying people must be or look or speak or give a certain way to belong. Forgive us when we have believed or even insisted that our tradition is the only way to meet you, that the way we've always done it is the way it always must be done, that what we understand now is all there is to know. With some trepidation, we pray that you would come among us this day, turn over the tables, drive out our hubris, that we may see as you see and then pursue your vision that we may care about those with whom you to, about those whom you care about that we may see Christ in each other and in the world around us we ask this in the name of the one who embodies your presence here and everywhere Jesus the Christ amen
Our scripture this morning comes from the book of John. Chapter 2, verses 13 to 25, and I am reading from the Common English Bible. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found the temple, he found in the temple those who were selling cattle, sheep, and doves, as well as those involved in exchanging currency, sitting there. He made a whip from ropes and chased them all out of the temple including the cattle and the sheep. He scattered the coins and overturned the, temp the tables of those who exchanged currency. He said to the dove sellers, get these things out of here. Don't make my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it is written, passion for your house consumes me. Then the Jewish leaders asked him, by what authority are you doing these things? What miraculous sign will you show me? And Jesus answered, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jewish leaders replied, it took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But the temple Jesus was talking about was his body. After he raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. While Jesus was in Jerusalem for the Passover festival, many believed in his name because they saw the miraculous signs that he did. But Jesus didn't trust himself to them because he knew all people. He didn't need anyone to tell him about human nature, for he knew what human nature was. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right. Excellent. Let's move this up. Excellent. Well, I'm a bit of a walker. I hope that's okay. I'm not going to go down the aisle, but I will, you will find me wandering up here. I hope that doesn't distract you in any way, but I want to begin by kind of introducing myself as a preacher, how this is, how I approach things so that you'll know as we go forward. I follow what's called the narrative lectionary. This is a four-year cycle of scriptures in which every September you start in Genesis and every December of course you end with Christmas and then you spend the spring in from Christmas to Easter in a particular gospel this year we are in John I encourage you to take your Bible home look it up online feel free to read through it's not a horribly long gospel it is kind of a weird one. So we're going to talk a bit about what that means, what I mean when I say it's kind of a weird one. I also believe that we cannot learn from text, learn from scripture without understanding a bit about its context. We can't lift the gospel out of the first century and pretend that it all speaks to us exactly the same way. So I will always include a bit of context, a bit of way of understanding how this might have been seen in the first century before we get to how we see it in the 21st century. So I wanna begin with John as a gospel. John is, if you've ever read through all four, you know, John is a significantly different gospel, and it's different because it comes much later. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are sort of mid-first century, maybe a little later. They're all within a generation of each other, and in fact, Mark comes first. Matthew and Luke have used the stories of Mark as kind of an outline and expanded some. But John, John's a couple generations down the road. John for sure has experienced the fall of the temple, right? 
that, toward, that towards the end of the first century, the Romans, in, a, in an attempt to put down Jewish rebellions, burned the temple to the ground. All that's left is what we call the Wailing Wall, the East Wall. Perhaps you've seen that on the news. So John is writing after the fall of the temple. He is perhaps not in Jerusalem. He's farther out. And it may be that he has some vendettas. We hear John is the gospel that gets used the most often when Christians want to be anti-Semitic. Because John speaks of the Jews. This is where we have a first century, 21st century divide. John is not speaking of Jews in general. John, most likely, scholars tell us, is part of a little band of Jesus followers who were perhaps a bit too obnoxious and got kicked out of the synagogue. So he has a vendetta, right? He's speaking specifically about a certain, just like Paul, he's speaking specifically about certain people, not overall. Also, whereas the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Luke have, they're seeking to tell a story, right, from particular points of view, if you've read them, you know, Luke and Matthew have really different points of view, but they're still telling kind of the same story with the same bits and pieces. John, not so much. John is less concerned with plot than with credo. Credo is I believe. John is less concerned with telling us how Jesus went about life and more concerned with telling us who Jesus is. It is meant to bolster believers already. It is less an evangelism tool than it is an inner reassurance tool. Does that make sense? Okay. Now John, unlike his other gospel writers, starts where they end. He does, of course, that first chapter, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and right? But, essentially, Jesus is introduced to us upsetting the temple. The story that all the other gospels put at the end Right, that last week of his life, John starts with. And in fact, John builds his entire gospel around three Passovers. So not only isn't this the end, this is Jesus' first Passover. John has a very specific kind of story that he's telling and he's setting us up for it. Now, we do have to remember, it's easy to say, oh, well, they were corrupt merchants, they were charging too much, but the reality is that the temple in Jerusalem was a tourist attraction. It was huge. In fact, it was a massive complex that was maybe 13 or 14 soccer fields or 13 or 14 football fields, if that makes, if that makes a, better, a better comparison. It was a huge complex with many courts. There was the court of the Gentiles, the court of women, the court of men, and the farther in you go, of course, the more quote unquote holy you had to be until you know only the priests were allowed at the very holy of holies. But in the meantime, it was a massive, remarkable structure and people came from all over to see it and the Jews came to Jerusalem for four different festivals Passover being one of the biggest and so they came from all over and it was a celebration they were celebrating liberation 
right? Celebrating liberation from slavery, celebrating the, way, the time when Moses led them out of Egypt across the Red Sea and into the desert. The time when God gave them their freedom. You can imagine that this is a bit dicey for the Roman governor. This is a bit scary. You got a bunch of people coming in from all over to celebrate their freedom all while you're in charge and making sure that Rome keeps their thumb down on these people, keep it all under control. Nobody needs to get all rebellion -y. It's a little tempting, a little scary. But nonetheless, there is still this joy going on. You know, you have your, your sellers with their glow necklaces and their spinny things that you blow on or whatever's cool now at parades, right? You have your flags, kids begging for balloon animals and slushies and, oh my goodness, is this beginning to sound familiar? You've been to this fair, you've been to this party, you've seen it. And so we have to understand that the temple is part of a status quo, right? It is, much like the Vatican, it is its own entity. In order to make donations, you have to have shekels. And in order to have shekels, you have to exchange your money from wherever you're from. So you need money changers in the outer court. They've been there forever. Nothing wrong with that. If you wanted to make a sacrifice to show your love or loyalty, to give thanks and praise, you needed to purchase a dove, a calf, a lamb. You didn't want to drag these animals the 50 miles with you. You're coming on foot. You might get hungry on the way. So, those people are necessary too, and this has gone on for hundreds of years. This is how it works. People come in, they trade their money for shekels, they buy they buy their animals to sacrifice. They make their donations. This is how it works. This is how we do it. And you can imagine that in the midst of this huge complex, there are more than one, there are more than one site of money changers and animal sellers. There are probably four or five, who knows, but this is probably not the only one. And Jesus, well, Jesus is one person out of hundred of, uh, of a hundred thousand or whatever, thousands of people in and streaming in and out of this complex, filling these courtyards. And Jesus chooses one station and upends it all. One commentator calls it a temple tantrum. He's throwing a fit. Realistically, my New Testament professor, Amy Jill Levine, says, realistically, nobody noticed that it was a small thing in a small corner of a huge complex. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but there's something else going on here. John, I think, doesn't care whether it was a big deal or a small deal or whether Jesus was being dramatic or principled. John's not interested in that. Here is what I think John is interested in. He throws the tantrum to get some leadership attention. And they do it. They say, by what authority are you doing these things? What miraculous sign will you show us? And Jesus answered, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. 
The Jewish leaders replied, it took 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days? But the temple Jesus was talking about was his body. Do you catch that? The temple Jesus was talking about was his body. After he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered what he had said and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. When the Israelites were wandering in the desert, they built the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. If you've ever read Exodus, there is some, there's like whole chapters of very specific building instruction. Some general con contractor could probably come along and, and take this and recreate it. But it was something that they could roll up and take with them every time they moved. Eventually, we know that Solomon builds the first temple. The first temple takes the place of the tabernacle. It gets burned down when, when the Babylonians come through, when they annihilate Jerusalem and carry most of the people out. And eventually, the second temple gets built. And Jesus is saying, this too will be replaced. This too will fall. Essentially, Jesus is replacing the temple, right? Jesus' body becomes the temple, the place where God resides. And that, my friends, is where John wants to start. He's not giving us baby Jesus in a manger with gifts and chubby cheeks. He's not giving us young Jesus in the temple, having stolen away from his parents. Mary totally ticked off because she can't find him. You remember that story? It's a great story. She's so mad. Because he's, you know, don't you know I was in my father's house? Total 12-year-old sass. John's not giving us any of that. John is beginning with Jesus as the seat of God. Maybe that doesn't sound too radical to our ears. We're Christians. We've been saying Jesus is the seed of God for a long time. But for John and his little band of followers of the way, this was revolutionary. This made no sense. And it might be that we could even, on some level, read the upset of the temple as a metaphor, as a way of making concrete the point that John is trying to get to, which is that Jesus upsets everything that Jesus' very presence as the seat of God changes the world. I know, I know, you're not surprised. It's not revolutionary to you. But what does it mean for us here? You all are starting a new era, a new era of being champion Christian church, a new era, and you're... And we're going to be asking questions. We're going to spend at least the next year talking and asking and sharing and wondering who are we now and where are we going? And if Jesus upsets the status quo, 
if Jesus overturns the tables and drives out the animals, then what is Jesus telling us? What is John through Jesus telling us? That Jesus will turn even his own house upside down. It's not very comforting. Nobody wants to hear that. Goodness gracious knows I'm not a big fan of change. You're not a big fan of change. It's scary, it's intimidating, it makes you anxious, it makes me anxious. But Jesus is the seat of God. And Jesus turns the world upside down. And we as a little band of followers of the way, we uh, as Jesus' people are going to be called to upend the tables. To think about lots of different ways to maybe let go of some things in order to grab others. There's going to be lots of ideas flowing. But I want you to hold on to John's credo, John's I believe. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And if we believe that, then we live it. And when we live it, we turn the world upside down. Amen. We're introducing a new feature um, I invite you to spend some time with this video in just a couple as a You will hear from more than just me starting next week, I promise. Yesterday I had the opportunity to help out in the food ministry. I don't know if you've ever had that, if you've ever taken that opportunity or not, but let me tell you that is like Swiss clock perfection. Man, people slide through there. The Armstrongs have got everything sorted and figured out. People have a buggy. People drive in. They say, I've got three people, six people in my family. Someone takes a buggy. They come through. They pick up a box of food marked for however many. They put another sack in of bread and dried goods, and then they come through. And I was in charge of sweet potatoes. They were kind of the size of my head. 
were huge. And we put a bag of sweet potatoes in there and then a bag of onions and then some orange juice and some little fruit cups and some butter. And then the cart was wheeled out the door, loaded into the person's car, and on they went. And folks, you are feeding people. When Jesus said, feed the hungry, I can't help but think that in the 21st century, this, this is an extraordinary way of feeding the hungry in your community. You are making a difference. And so when we call, when we talk about stewardship, yes, we're going to talk a little bit about stewardship. When we talk about that, we're talking about our time. Do you know how much time it takes folks to set that up? Do you know how many folks it takes to set that up? Time, talents, and yes, treasure, all of it. But all of it makes a difference to that family in that car, that family right there in front of you, someone you could pass on the street and may never know that they needed the extra help, that your food this week meant that they could pay their electric bill. That is the body of Christ, my friends. And it is a fabulous ministry. Will you pray with me? Gracious and holy God, we are overwhelmed by the blessings in your world, by all of the things that you have given us, by all of the ways that we can have the opportunity to serve. We pray that you will continue to call upon our hearts, that you will direct us outward, that we might see the opportunities to be the presence of Christ, and that we might support all of that with our time, our talents, our treasure, that this might be the center of change, the center of ministry in this community. Amen. Okay, sorry. Will you join me in the communion hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be?
Let us ready our hearts and minds as we prepare for communion today. Jesus modeled for us how to live in God's love. He took time away for self-examination and reflection as he prepared himself for ministry. When tempted in the wilderness, he leaned on the words of scripture to guide him on God's path of truth and light. And in the upper room, he shared with his closest friends nourishment that extends far beyond the physical body. We are invited today to share in that life-giving feast as we are nourished in God's love and grace. Allow yourself to receive God's grace and open yourself to where God is calling you to express your faith, to be in ministry in a new way. Come, receive, and then go out into the world renewed. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, whose power overcomes even sin and death, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. We thank you for the freedom we now have because of what he did not fear to face. We thank you for the communion symbols of bread and cup that remind us of all he gave to free us. Please fill us also with the spirit that empower Jesus, that we may boldly carry out your will in our lives, in our world, and most of all, that we may share the good news of your love for us with the world still caught in fear. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, amen. And now we know that Jesus and his friends gathered in an upper room. And as they sat at the table telling their big fish stories, they ate. And as they finished, as they reclined, Jesus looked around the table and picked up a loaf of bread. And he blessed it and he broke it, and he handed it to them, saying, this, this is my body broken for you as often as you eat of this bread, do so in remembrance of me. And likewise, he poured a cup and held it out to his friends, saying this, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sin as often as you sit at this table and drink this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Friends, you are welcome at the table. Every week, we as the body of Christ extend to those around us the opportunity to be part of this community. If you are feeling called to be a part of Champion Christian Church, if this particular body of Christ feels right to you, we want to welcome you. We want to offer you the hospitality of our lives. Feel free to make an appointment with me or to speak with those among you. 
This is a community worth joining. It is a community worth living in. And we want to invite you to do so. And will you join me now in our closing hymn, We Dedicate This Temple. Friends, I invite you now to go in peace, knowing that you are a loved member of the body of Christ, taking Christ out into the world like the light that shines in the darkness and will not end. Amen.